Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Welcome to St. Anselm College. My name is Lauren Chulgen, and I'm a senior history major here at St. Anselm. I am also the chair of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics Kevin Harrington Student Ambassador Program. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff, of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics and St. Anselm College. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's very special event with General David Petraeus. As a senior, I have been fortunate to see many a speaker, intellectual, politician, and even future president grace my campus. St. Anselm students have access to incredible political action, making each of us not only better citizens, but also even greater students of the liberal arts. With every speaker comes great dialogue and the opportunity to bring our community closer and closer together. By learning about different ideologies, opinions, and experiences, it only betters us as human beings. I thoroughly appreciate the time General Petraeus has taken out of his very busy schedule to enlighten us on his life and work as it is another great opportunity for St. Anselm students to be civically engaged. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank Comcast Communications for taping tonight's event, which will be made available through On Demand after April 1st. Now, I would like to introduce my classmate, Evan Weaver, who is a senior politics major and Army cadet. He will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now I would ask that you please remain standing in a moment of silence to honor our fallen service men and women, especially those we have lost from this college and those we have lost who have family and friends here with us today. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I am very pleased to introduce the president of St. Anselm College, Father Johnson Day Felice, who will introduce tonight's special guest. Thank you, Evan. And thank you all for being here this evening. Welcome to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Well, not exactly the Institute of Politics. We're in the Dana Center at St. Anselm College, uh, which sometimes is an extension of the Institute. But this wonderful event, as you know, is being sponsored by the college's Institute of Politics. As you probably know and have hopefully witnessed, our Institute has been providing us with the opportunity to hear from some fascinating and stimulating speakers, including our special guest this evening. We are very excited to have General David Petraeus with us and to share him with all of you. The work of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics is important to the college, but it could not be achieved without the generous support of the community. Tonight, we would like to thank our supporting sponsor, BAE Systems, for helping to make this event possible. Thank you all. <clears throat> I would now like to introduce tonight's moderator, Mr. Josh McKelvin. Mr. McKelvin is a political reporter and news anchor for WMUR-TV in Manchester. He is also a former United States Marine. He served during the first Gulf War and specialized in aviation ordnance and chemical weapons. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, General David Petraeus, who will speak to, with us about the surge in Iraq and the role of the U.S. forces overseas. General Petraeus is noted for his longtime distinguished military career, 
in which he has worked with presidents and administrations from both political parties. He was promoted to commander of the U.S. Central Command in October of 2008 after serving several tours in Iraq and as top commander in Iraq for more than 19 months. General Petraeus is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, a top graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and he has earned his MPA and PhD degrees in international relations from Princeton University. I think we can all agree that tonight we will be hearing from one of the most influential and fascinating fellow Americans, General Petraeus. Thank you, thank you, thanks, thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you all for being here, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, you know, when he graduated from West Point in 1974, he was commissioned as second lieutenant and infantry officer, as you might expect. In his 35 plus years of military service, he's seen quite a few things from the end of the Vietnam War, to the decline of the Cold War, to some grandiose plans like Star Wars. But <laughs> now he is the head of the U.S. Central Command in, uh, for the United States, uh, based in Tampa. And basically his role is to oversee the umbrella, which has become the, you know, the shadow of, of all the wars that we're fighting right now. We, you and I have come to know it as the War on Terror. I'm sure the President would prefer that you call it Operations uh, contingency overseas, something along those lines, but first of all, welcome very much, uh, General, good to see you. Well, thanks very much. It is great to be back in New Hampshire. Uh, as some of you know, this is our state of legal residence. Every soldier gets to choose one of those at some point in time, and I remember fondly when I was 21 or 22 years old and went to the keeper of the list in West Springfield, New Hampshire. I think her name was Hazel Patton. It was a wood-fired stove, by golly. and. Uh, I tried to convince her that I was suitable for inclusion on the list of West Springfield. And <laughs> after a couple of hours, I guess I was successful. My, my wife's parents uh, and really her grandparents, uh, longtime residents up there. So it's great to be back. We have live free or die on our license plates uh, on our car still and uh, have always enjoyed that. Uh, it's good to be in what uh, quite a few folks would regard as America's academic heartland, uh, if you stretch it down, of course, into Massachusetts and so forth. Folks down in Princeton don't share that, but it is nice to be back in that. <laughs> and, uh, and I must say that as a, uh, a lifelong uh, New York Yankees fan, uh, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm, I'm particularly honored to be warmly welcomed to the heart of Red Sox Nation. Um, especially since the stars and moon are back in proper alignment after last year's World Series. We'll see. I, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see about that. I was in Iraq in, uh, I think it was 2004, um, and the Yankees were up three games to naught. Looked like everything was on track and on course, and something happened on do, the do way. Do you know what happened? I, I, was I, busy, I was busy fighting, and so I'd rather not have... <laughs> I've tried to suppress those memories. Um, I want to thank uh, your president. Where did he go, by the way? Where is uh, Mr. President here? There he is. Uh, Father Jonathan, thanks very much for your kind introduction. Thanks for your invitation to speak here with you tonight. Uh, I know that this is called a college with a conscience, uh, and I know that you have had a lot to do with that. And I know that this great institution, St. A's, ben benefits enormously uh, from your leadership, and I'd ask actually everyone join me in showing just that. Thank you. <laughs> For some reason, I, I, uh, I've got this, uh, you know, team, of course, that helps me with all this stuff. We call them the designated thinkers. Every commander needs it. It's like designated hitter in the Boston Red Sox, except we have designated thinkers and hired pens. And they kept 
coaching me, you know, about this word, St. Anselm. And I said, I think I got that. I've heard this once or twice before. But they were quite concerned about that because I gather that Wolf Blitzer and Peter Jennings uh, didn't quite get their... <laughs> But get their mouth around that, and I, uh, they said, you don't want to be one of those who can pronounce Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, but not St. Anselm, so I think I've passed that <laughs> test. Uh, Josh, I want to thank you for, uh, for doing this tonight. Uh, again, Semper Fi, an old Marine, uh, who's then uh, obviously had great success uh, in the media realm, uh, but we appreciate your service, and uh, I look forward to our time here tonight. Now, my team, oh wait, where are the P's greeters? Are there some peace greeters in here? Could you stand up, please? Uh. I will end, uh, as we almost always do, by thanking an audience for its support of our men and women in uniform. You know, there can be debate about some of the endeavors we've undertaken. I understand that. I remember driving away we had a son who was going to school in MIT, and we were driving away from Cambridge one time, and there was a sign over the bridge. This is when I was the commander in Iraq. It said, hate the war, love the troops. And I said, 50% ain't bad, and they got the right 50%. <laughs> um, the truth is America has gotten it right in that regard, uh, and it did not get it right in Vietnam. I think that was, everyone would agree, a, 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 quite a stain in in a way, and in the way we treated men and women who were drafted and went off and did what their country asked them to do, did it faithfully, in many cases uh, suffered injuries and came home and were not welcomed home. Uh, and all of America has gotten this right this time, I think. But folks like the Pease Greeters in particular uh, ensure that our young men and women, uh, actually both deploying and redeploying, uh, are more than just patted on the back, but taken great care of while they're passing through peas. And we thank you uh, very much for all of that. Again, that is very kind of you. Um, I had a joke here somewhere. I've got to try this out here. Let me get to my cards here. I, you know, I can't, got to go through all this, you know. They, they've got a hand up my back making my lips talk. Um, Was that the joke? Uh, and I'm trying to get to it here. I'll get to it. Ah, here it is. <laughs> As a commander, I am frequently on the road and meet troopers from all over the country. During a recent trip, I had the opportunity to speak with a soldier from New Hampshire, and he shared me with me a bit of New England humor. It seems that there were these four guys driving in a car together, one from Maine, one from Vermont, one from Massachusetts, and one from New Hampshire. Down the road a bit, the man from Maine starts throwing bags of potatoes out the car window. Man from New Hampshire says, what are you doing that for? The man from Maine replies, we have so darn many potatoes lying around in our state that I'm just sick and tired of seeing these things. And he threw the rest of the potatoes out the window. Down the road a bit more, the man from Vermont starts throwing jugs of maple syrup out the car window. Man from New Hampshire asks, what are you doing that for? Man from Vermont replies, we have so darn many of these jugs lying around our state, I'm just sick and tired of seeing these things, and he threw the last jug out the window. And moments later, you guessed it, the man from New Hampshire threw the man from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for laughing, you know. <laughs> Wasn't sure how that was going to go over. I guess we're in the right state of the side of the boundary here. Uh, but you know, when you reach this station in life, you're only as good as the material they give you. So I appreciate your working <laughs> with me. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and fire away. Well, half of it was in the delivery, and you delivered well, it well, yeah, sir. There we go. Something it. like that. Thank just to give you an idea, we uh, compiled a series of questions. A lot of them were submitted from the student body here at St. A. Some faculty and teachers also submitted questions, as well as questions from the general public, and if you don't mind, we indulge by coming Indeed. up with a few of our own. Now let's start with <laughs> Al-Qaeda. Uh, nine years ago, we're coming up on nine years since the 9-11 attacks, how would you characterize the level of the capability of Al-Qaeda to conduct another major attack on U.S. soil? Well, as we look at Al-Qaeda, and let me, by the way, I am 
as a four-star U.S. Army general officer, uh, I have an inalienable First Amendment right to the use of PowerPoint slides <laughs> and, uh, and laser pointer. Uh, there's actually, if you look at the First Amendment, there's a little asterisk and you go down and fine print says. Um, and so in a moment, I will show you the connectivity of Al-Qaeda. It is a network. Uh, and it takes a network, by the way, to deal with that. You have to put pressure on that network uh, wherever it is. So as we look at al-Qaeda in the Central Command region, which is where, frankly, uh, the al-Qaeda senior leadership are located, they are in the federally administered tribal areas of western Pakistan, that mountainous region between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, as you look at, of course, al-Qaeda, Iraq, uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, now called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Al-Qaeda in a number of other areas, we generally assess that Al-Qaeda has been diminished uh, in our particular area of responsibility, that the Al-Qaeda senior leaderships have suffered some considerable blows, uh, that coupled with the pressure that the Pakistanis have put on the Pakistani Taliban has been, been helpful. Uh, they have carried out quite impressive operations, in fact. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, diminished enormously. I'll show somebody if you want to see the security incidents data, the, the old familiar uh, statistics, if you will, that show that the level of violence, which was at something like 220 attacks per day uh, in spring of 2007, is now down to well under 20 per day. Still some horrific attacks on occasion, still violence, still concerning, but at a level uh, that allows Iraq to rebuild its damaged infrastructure to add, for example, last year 1,300 megawatts to their electrical grid to have an election. The people defied al-Qaeda in that and so forth. The one area where we are concerned is Yemen. Uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was franchised there last year uh, by the senior leadership of al-Qaeda. Uh, but even there, there has been pressure uh, on them in uh, recent months in particular, and President Saleh of Yemen uh, has been uh, really quite concerned about the uh, growth of al-Qaeda there, and there's been a, quite a good effort by all involved, and we are part of that uh, in cooperation and in support of the, our Yemeni partners uh, to deal with uh, al-Qaeda there and to try to disrupt it and over time uh, to degrade it. Now, having said that, uh, there is no question but that al-Qaeda retains uh, capability, and it is, it is a learning organization. Uh, it is constantly looking for opportunities, and of course, Abdul Muttalib, the would-be Detroit bomber uh, on the aircraft on Christmas Day, was an example of that. And he, by the way, did spend about two and a half months in Yemen uh, prior to going back to Africa, two different locations, then went to London, and then got on the flight to Detroit. And he was indeed outfitted with his explosive, and uh, taught how to use it and so forth uh, while he was in Yemen. We're, we're quite certain about that. So uh, Al-Qaeda does very much want to carry out uh, strikes against uh, our partners in the region, uh, against our allies around the world, and against us. And it, this requires extraordinary vigilance, determination, uh, just constant uh, keeping after this particular enemy. Um, this is not the kind of war where you take the hill, plant the flag, and go home to a victory parade. Uh, this is an, an endeavor that uh, requires enduring commitment, uh, and as I mentioned, determination, persistence, uh, and also, by the way, extraordinary cooperation between all the different uh, commands and agencies, intelligence elements, and everything else that are involved in this, some of them domestic, some obviously uh, international. Now, post 9-11, one of the biggest criticisms was uh, a lack of communication between agencies. How has that improved and how is the intelligence gathering? You talk about knowledge being everything and understanding how this network operates. How has that improved as much as you can speak to? Well, I, we think it's improved considerably. I, I will tell you that, for example, I, I chair along uh, with the Commander of Special Operations Command, sometimes the Director of CIA or others, uh, different uh, <coughs> either gatherings or, in some cases, secure video teleconferences that are literally global secure video teleconferences where everyone is trying to ensure that we all have the same understanding of the network. In fact, let me, I'm going to prowl a little bit here. You know, it helps. Uh, and I'd like to see, can you show up the star slide that shows Al-Qaeda just to give you a sense of the network as we see it? 
Now, this is centered on uh, Central Command. And just to remind you, Central Command consists of 20 countries uh, from Egypt in the west over to Pakistan in the east, Kazakhstan up in the north, down to uh, Yemen and the waters off Somalia in the south. So it's those 20 countries right there. We wanted to show with this slide, though, that Al-Qaeda is indeed a network that certainly goes well beyond our boundaries. And so we have to coordinate, uh, all of us coordinate. This is African Command. This is European Command. Uh, the Far East, of course, is Pacific Command. And then, of course, we have Northern Command. In fact, uh, so, and again, you have to keep pressure on that network wherever they are. You cannot get into the whack-a-mole game. You have to whack all the moles wherever they may be. Uh, to use that particular uh, image or metaphor. In fact, why don't you uh, pop up just quickly, I do want to just remind you what Central Command is and where we fit in the grand scheme of things. There are six of us, uh, geographic combatant commanders, then four other uh, commanders, unified commanders as well, that provide forces or perform a specific function. But the world is basically divided up in, in six areas. Uh, and you can see here Central Command, and as the staff often notes, we're the smallest of the geographic combatant commands, but we're proud to have the most problems. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Well, part of the, obviously, uh, intelligence gathering centers on interrogation. And uh, uh, in your opinion, how the interrogation from suspects that we have in custody what we employ now, how has that improved or It's, it's working since? well, yeah. In fact, when I was the uh, commander of the Combined Arms Center as a three-star out at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, among the different elements that were part of that command, we had about 18 different schools and centers that did all the education of our commissioned, non-commissioned warrant officer leaders, the combat training centers with the scenarios that prepare our forces. Um, we also had the doctrine center. And one of the products, you know, we're fairly well known that during that time we published the counterinsurgency field manual. The Army and the Marine Corps did this together. It was quite a very important uh, intellectual contribution. It was really the foundation for what we did in Iraq and what we're doing now in Afghanistan. The truth is, by the way, as I mentioned to the press earlier, the, the, the real surge in Iraq was not the surge of what turned out to be 30,000 additional forces. The most important surge in Iraq was a surge of ideas. And these ideas were captured initially in the effort to develop the counterinsurgency field manual. Then they were published in counterinsurgency guidance that I issued as the commander in Iraq. And it had had a series of admonitions followed by explanations. Because a strategic leader gets paid to get the big ideas right, in this case, the counterinsurgency guidance captured those big ideas, then to communicate those big ideas effectively throughout the breadth and depth of the organization, then to oversee their implementation, and then to capture best practices or worst practices so that you can refine the big ideas, uh, communicate them effectively, oversee their implementation, and you're constantly doing that. And by the way, now all of this, we see it as enabled by information technology because you can have virtual communities, you can flatten organizations. You know, In fact, we, we say flatten the organization as much as you're comfortable with and then take it another, another level. And that's how we tried to do that. But among those big ideas, for example, was secure the population. Do it by living with the people. Uh, live our values is a hugely important one. Uh, be first with the truth. Uh, support reconciliation, and on and on. Well, the live our values is caught up in the whole interrogation issue. Um, and I would argue uh, there are two reasons to live your values. First of all, you know, Decades for centuries, great patriots from our country have fought to preserve and protect those values. They're the result of enormous intellectual debate and discussion. Uh, and, and in a sense, they're the right, it's the right thing to do. But occasionally people will say, well, you know, gosh, the enemy's not doing that, so why are we tying our hands behind our back by living our values? Uh, and in that regard, uh, I'd say that there's a practical argument. And that is that if you don't live your values, you pay for it in the long run. Uh, if you have an Abu Ghraib, it never goes away. That is a non-biodegradable. That's a stain, and that we get beat around the head and shoulders constantly about that out in my particular area of responsibility. For what it's worth, that is why I have said that we should close Gitmo. 
It's because there's a, there's a tainting of that. Gitmo is actually a superb facility. It is very, very humane. It's run properly and all the rest. Um, come a, you know, there's the old orange jumpsuit pictures from the beginning. This is a long stretch since that. But it, it has an image. And that image, perceptions are reality. And the perceptions of it are harmful out in our area of responsibility. We published a field manual during that same time again, uh, and it was uh, called the Human Intelligence Collector's Manual, something like that. It was really the interrogation manual, and it said what you could and could not do, and it was very much in line with our values and with the law of land warfare, the Geneva Convention, et cetera. Uh, and we have practiced that ever since, uh, based on Senator McCain and other pushing others in the Senate pushing it forward. It became the law. It has a, it's not just a manual. It has the force of law. Uh, and again, we have observed it, it works, and we believe that that is an appropriate way uh, to carry out that particular task. All right, so you have some high-level operatives in custody. Where do you try them? Much has been made about open court in New York City, for yep. instance, or before a military yep. tribunal. No, I mean, I had this question uh, actually when I was testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, among those was uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who, by the way, worked for us a couple of times as Colonel Lindsey Graham of the staff judge advocate of the U.S. Air Force. And to be truthful, my response to him was, that is one that I need them to solve. That's not, not our sort of area of expertise, if you will. Uh, you know, when you close Gitmo, what you have to do, I always have said you have to do it responsibly. I, I realize I am then putting that task in the rucksack of someone else. But that's what the Department of Justice gets paid to do, and they can figure out you know, whether to do it. And Senator Graham, in fact, has a proposal, a bipartisan proposal, as a matter of fact, working with the White House uh, to determine what that jurisdiction could be, uh, how it could be carried out, whether it's a military tribunal or, again, uh, in some jurisdiction in the United States. Let's talk about Iraq now. Uh, elections are in the very near future. What do you hope to see come out of these elections, or what do you expect? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I expect to see is a good bit of high political drama for a while, frankly. Uh, this is a very, very uh, challenging situation for a new democracy or Iraqracy, as we sometimes call it. Um, Iraq has had a government that has been generally representative of all the people of Iraq. Sunni Shia, uh, Arab Kurd, Christian Yazidi, Shabak, Turkmen, you name it, all of them. And it has generally been responsive to all the people, in part because the Council of Representatives has known that they have to face an election. It's amazing what happens. I mean, it really was, in, it actually was. It's, this is, I, pro, I guess, like watching what took place, perhaps uh, really in maybe our nation, any nation that's a new democracy where the, the, those who are holding office realize they have to win an election to keep their job. And it had a very salutary effect. And they got serious about corruption, they got serious about this, serious about that. Not all perfect. Uh, but I think there are other, you know, democracies in the world where, again, there's a bit of political drama as well on occasion. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we hope that what emerges will be a council of representatives and then prime minister, president, speaker of the council, the three big positions, uh, that this will also be a government that is broadly <laughs> representative of the people and is responsive to the desires of the people. Uh, that we think that the numbers will drive the establishment of a cross, definitely cross-ethnic. It has to be Kurds as well as Arabs. And we hope to see cross-sectarian uh, coalitions as well, Sunni as well as Shia. The Shia, it's a Shia predominant majority country, uh, well over 50%. Uh, and the lead element, the lead coalition, will be led by a Shia. That is, I think, a, a foregone conclusion. But it's not 100% certain that it will be Prime Minister Maliki or his coalition. They probably will end up with two, three, four more council representative seats than the others. The elections will be announced, uh, final results will be announced on Friday. They're at about the 95% mark in terms of tabulating. And uh, so that's what we expect to see. What's made this possible, by the way, again, without question, is some extraordinary work by our young men and women in uniform, together with a great number of courageous young Iraqi men and even women, uh, because they do have women in their military and their police. Um, and 
also by uh, some great coalition partners. And if you can show me the security incident slide, I do want to show this just to give you a sense of where we are in terms of the security situation. Because what it will show you is how this is all the way at 2004 right here, 1 January 2004. This is last Friday night. Each one of these lines is a week's worth of what are called security incidents. It's attacks plus attempted attacks. In other words, improvised explosive devices that were found rather than blew up. But we still want to keep track of those. And what you can see is the level of violence uh, was roughly around in here. These spikes, I can explain why each one of them, one, one or two were uh, keyed to an election or uh, Ramadan or something else. But it was roughly going along here. And then you had this horrific bombing of the Samara Mosque. It's a Shia shrine in a Sunni area, and it unleashed uh, the sectarian violence, a cycle of violence that was truly horrifying, and it just kept climbing. And in around here, the decision was made to conduct the surge. The level of violence went up, understandably, because now we're taking the fight to the enemy. We're taking away sanctuaries and safe havens from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Ultimately, we confronted the militia as well. Uh, that's the Shia militia, the Al-Qaeda with Sunni uh, Arab and uh, so forth. And over time, as we took away their sanctuaries, as we moved into the neighborhoods, we created 77 additional locations just in Baghdad alone, as an example, where our soldiers and Iraqi soldiers co-located, but started driving down the level of violence. Thankfully, it happened sufficiently before the September 2007 testimony to Capitol Hill. Uh, needless to say, we were uh, concerned about the Washington clock, which seemed to be moving a little bit more rapidly than the Baghdad clock on most days. Um, but we were given more time on the clock, and it continued to come down. We fought the militia in here. It's Prime Minister Maliki's decision to confront them in Basra, quite a tough fight, and continued bringing it down. And you can see roughly now for about, oh, six, seven months or so, uh, been down at a level that, as I said, on a daily attack basis is well under 20 attacks per day compared with up here was 220 attacks or more, actually, per day. So quite a significant reduction. Still have been horrific car bombs at times. When for a period, it was almost every 45 days in Baghdad. And Al-Qaeda is definitely still there, still trying to challenge uh, the Iraqi governmental institutions, trying to undermine them, trying to foment a reignition of sectarian violence. But there's more than, there's almost 700,000 Iraqi security force members now, and they are generally uh, fairly competent. And they are generally, and some of them are exceedingly competent. Their special operations forces, others, very, very good. And they are continuing the pressure as we are now stepping out of the leadership role and as we approach um, one, uh, one uh, September 31, August, when we will conduct an actual mission change and we will go to become a, an advise and assist force. All of our brigades will become advise and assist brigades, and we'll be down at that 50,000 number uh, by then. We're somewhere in the 96,000 range right now. Do we still expect to see the, I mean, the combat troops are expected to be out of Iraq entirely by the end of next year. Can we still expect that? I mean, the level of uh, violence, uh, the reduction <coughs> of the level of violence seemed to indicate things are stable. And the Iraqi forces yeah. themselves are being... I, I think that is, uh, is fair to project. They're likely, again, it's up to this next Iraqi government, clearly. But there is very possibly some relationship that will continue in what we would call a traditional security assistance relationship, perhaps with uh, continued sharing of intelligence or what have you. That has been very helpful to them. It's their forces going through the door. We do it all arrest warrant based now, by the way. There's a the Iraqi legal system is supporting what we do. Uh, so unless it's an immediate threat situation, the only time uh, forces go out and detain someone, Iraqi forces this is, with our support occasionally, uh, is with a arrest warrant from the Iraqi judicial system. Uh, so we do think that's possible. We, we think it is, again, likely that there will be some kind of traditional security assistance role uh, which is something we have with virtually all the countries in the region with the exception of Iran and, and say, Syria. Uh, in fact, we have very robust contingents uh, in uh, places like Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and elsewhere. Saudi Arabia, for just to give an example, we have a two-star general, a one-star general, and another one-star general that just do the security assistance roles that we have there. We've got about, all told, about 210,000 
soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, a little over that, I think, right now, uh, in the central command area of responsibility. And, and that's a, an important component of what we do, in addition to Iraq, Afghanistan, the support to Pakistan, and, and some of the other efforts that uh, counter al-Qaeda. General, I want to ask you a question that came from one of the staff members here. What, what can Americans look at and say, you know, it was a good thing that we went into Iraq, but weapons of mass destruction were never found. We're not getting the favorable oil deals that many expected that would come out of all this. Uh, so people are wondering, what did we accomplish? What was, what was the point? Well, look, history is going to be the judge of that. Uh, you know, and I've gotten these questions at various times. Um, I mean, we, th we felt, I was in the original, you know, 101st Airborne Division commander. I'm proud, thank you for that. I'm um, proud, to, very proud to have commanded the great Screaming Eagles uh, in the fight to Baghdad and then in the first year uh, in Iraq. Um, I mean, certainly the fact that Saddam is gone is, you know, of enormous significance. Uh, certainly that there is a form of nascent democracy, Iraqracy, whatever else, quite important in a region. I mean, here's a test question for you. 20 countries, Egypt to Pakistan, Kazakhstan to Yemen. What's the most democratic country in those 20 countries? Are you asking me to answer? I am. You know that better than I do. <laughs> Which one? I mean, it, I believe it or not, arguably it is Iraq. I mean, it, Lebanon has elections, but there's a complicated system, as you know. But that will be Pakistan more defined at the end of these elections. Well, it will. much clearer picture. And, it, and we're, we touch wood every time we uh, talk about that, because there's no question about it. And, you know, the most important election for a country is not the first election, it's the second election, and arguably this is the second. There have been also provincial elections and some others, but this is the one that is the, the one where you actually have a true transition. And look, there is some political drama playing out right there now. And, and that potential, is to be understood. The potential certainly exists uh, that we can take a step back and we have to reevaluate our situation. Ambassador Ryan Crocker and I, my, you know, the greatest diplomatic wingman any soldier could have had uh, was Ambassador Ryan Crocker. I think this is his fifth or sixth embassy. Uh, the kind of individual that was always sent into the place that was, you know, and really, really challenged. Uh, he was in Syria when they took over his house. He was in uh, Pakistan before coming there. Uh, was in Lebanon or blown up, uh, an awesome diplomat and a true Arabist. And you'll recall what he and I used to say to Congress and what I still say uh, is that, yes, there has been substantial progress in Iraq, but it is fragile and it is reversible. Now, I do think it is less fragile and less reversible than certainly we, when we first said that. But uh, that still is the fact. There's no question about it. It's really going to be interesting in Iraq moving forward. You changed to Afghanistan now. And a lot of quest, uh, people have this question. What are the fundamental differences between the Taliban and al-Qaeda? I mean, a lot of people think of uh, you know, al-Qaeda, as you said, networks, money, passports, organizations, while the Taliban is a bunch of guys in the back of pickup trucks with, with uh, you know, brandishing rifles. I mean, what are the fundamental differences and how closely are they associated? Well, firstly, there is a symbiotic relationship is the term that Secretary Gates uses, which I think is very accurate. Uh, there's a symbiotic relationship between the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban and all of the other elements of the extremist syndicate that, are, uh, that have their bases, if you will, uh, their training camps, their headquarters, uh, and so forth, in the federally administered tribal areas of western Pakistan, an area that the Pakistani uh, Frontier Corps and Army have put considerable pressure on as they have gone after the Pakistani Taliban in particular and done very good work in Swat Valley and elsewhere. Uh, but in that area, all of these elements uh, generally have a relationship. At times it is actually contentious, but generally it is one of sharing tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, sharing sanctuary, safe haven, uh, transportation, uh, and so forth. Uh, and it's a fact that when the Taliban ran, Taliban, much bigger movement, of course, a Pashtun insurgency, really, if you think of it, but, but, but Islamic-based and, again, uh, quite conservative, to put it uh, mildly uh, in their outlook, uh, you know, closed all the girls' schools, quite oppressive polit uh, social practices, um, resort to indiscriminate violence and the rest of that. But when the Taliban ran Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda had its sanctuary there. And during that time, Al-Qaeda planned the 9-11 attacks in Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. The initial training of the would-be attackers was in uh, training camps in Afghanistan before they went to Germany and then ultimately to U.S. flight schools. So again, 
there, is, there are these relationships. We looked very hard at this during the process that played out for the, that two and a half month period, which I thought was very, very productive as President Obama took the whole national security team. I, I, I was recalling earlier, I think we did nine or 10 meetings with him, with him, just with him, and in, in of course a prep meeting for each one of those and preps for the preps. Uh, this was a very good process and the several uh, of the initial meetings were all about can you, you know, separate Al-Qaeda from the Taliban? What's the assurance that if the Taliban came back, Al-Qaeda would not? And I think you actually, I think we all concluded you have to be careful not to parse too, too finely uh, those kinds of distinctions and so forth. It's possible you can break up Taliban elements. We're certainly trying to do that at low and mid levels. There's been some uh, cases in which that's taken place. Uh, and obviously, there's a huge effort to put pressure on, uh, the on Al Qaeda wherever they may be. You know, why don't I just show you one thing, though, that what, well, as we talk about Afghanistan, let me just explain what we've tried to do there over the course of the last year, if I could. Uh, if you can put the puzzle slide up. Um, what we've tried to do is to get the inputs right. And we've taken about a year to do that. We knew, based on our experience in Iraq and elsewhere, the kinds of organizations that we needed. Uh, Three-star operational command, a very robust training mission, more robust than we had, didn't have a detainee rule of law task force. If you're gonna do reintegration or reconciliation, you've gotta have a cell that oversees it with dedicated intelligence people that can tell you who's reconcilable and who is irreconcilable, all the rest of this. We knew this from Iraq, but at the level of resources that we had, 30,000 US forces at the time, you just couldn't build all those. So we built these over the course of the past year. Some of that's still going on, still working it out. Then uh, everyone worked together, get the best uh, US and other international leaders in charge of that. Uh, as you know, recent change of the UN senior official there, of course, General McChrystal, some of these others familiar. Uh, he's UK, uh, UK as well. Then. Everyone worked together to get the big ideas right, to get the concepts right. And of course, there's a counterinsurgency guidance right there, civil military campaign plan to, to conduct all of this right here. One, this is uh, aimed at reducing civilian casualties without tying our soldiers' hands behind their back, because we would never do that. But you cannot have civilian casualties in the course of your military operations uh, if they were at all avoidable, because it that's a tactical action that undermines the strategic uh, effort. And then the resources to enable us to carry out these ideas under these leaders leading these organizations. And that's the uh, tens of thousands that were sent in 2009. Now the 30,000 surge announced by the president up at West Point. We're about 11,500 into that 30,000. Looks as if the logistics nation and transportation nation are going to make the commitment that I made to the president come true, which is that we'll have all those forces on the ground by the end of August, with the exception of one division headquarters that we don't need by then. Uh, and then other non-NATO and NATO forces, civilians funding and so forth. So that's what we've tried to do over the course of the last year. And now with the inputs right, you've seen the first of the outputs. And that is the operation that was conducted in central Helmand province, in Marja and in Nadi Ali and some other locales. Uh, that's still a work in progress. It's still ongoing. It's not consolidated. We're still largely through the clear phase and into the hold phase, but again, lots of effort. And the challenge, the most challenging aspect of this in, in each case is the Afghan local governance piece. Uh, that is something, again, this is a country that's been racked by 30 years of war, and it was one of the poorest nations in the world to begin with. Uh, there's, there's not a surplus of human capital, to put it mildly. There's 70% uh, illiteracy of police that can't read the laws that they're supposed to enforce, enormous challenges. And getting that local governance piece right so that it is serving the people rather than preying on them or corrupt or what have you uh, is indeed one of the long poles in that tent, if not the long pole. Now, you met with President uh, Karzai just a couple of weeks ago, is that correct? Yes. How much yeah. input does he have in the, in the effort? There's going Enormous on. input. In fact, one actually one of the unique aspects of the Central Hellman operation was that General McChrystal, with his Afghan counterpart, went and briefed uh, President Karzai, and then requested uh, guidance from President Karzai, which he'd, was not a request he'd ever had before, frankly, and then requested the go-ahead, uh, and all of which he provided. But that's this is this is 
again, this is going to be carried forward, ultimately, needless to say, and already in many respects, by Afghan leadership. Yes, there are challenges there. Yes, I mean, that's why he created the anti-corruption campaign and has given that a little bit more boost in the last uh, several days. Critically important. Uh, but um, they're the ones, again, at that point in time that are going to begin uh, taking over certain tasks uh, and obviously allow us to step back as we were able to do in Iraq over time uh, and then to ultimately allow us to thin out and then draw down. Yes, sir, you talk about the, the Afghan leadership. How much influence does President uh, Karzai have in over the clans, the different tribes throughout the region that are also warring with themselves and can't seem to get along and have any kind of semblance of a country? Well, first of all, I think it is not, there's a couple of myths out there. You know, one is that Afghanistan, it is the graveyard of empires. Yes, there have been, you know, the UK <coughs> was defeated there several times. It's a great speech by Foreign uh, Secretary David Milband of the UK down in MIT, as a matter of fact, the other day. And he reminded them that after each one of those defeats, the UK figured out a formula that gave them another several decades in each case of stability and, and peace in Afghanistan. Uh, Alexander the Great had to marry a, an Afghan woman ultimately to extricate himself, but you know, whatever it takes, and I'm sure General McChrystal is ready to do what's necessary. Uh, just joking, Annie McChrystal. Um, so, but again, uh, the idea that, that there's not a national conception of Afghanistan, again, is a little bit not, not completely accurate either. Yes, Local organizing structures are hugely important. Yes, there's friction and sometimes even fighting between tribal elements and, and a whole host of other uh, players, if you will, in this mix, some of whom are also, of course, illegal narcotics industry bosses and all, you know, again, this is an extraordinarily challenging uh, place. Uh, but as we used to say about Iraq, hard is not hopeless and, and it is a hugely important mission. We cannot let Afghanistan become a sanctuary once again for transnational extremists who can sit there and plot and then prepare for the kind of attack that we sustained on 9-11. Let's shift over to Pakistan. There's a number of foreign policy experts, military experts, who say that the thing that keeps them up, the one region of the area that keeps, of the world that keeps them up at night, that they worry about more than any other, it's not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq, it's not Iran, it's not Yemen, but it's Pakistan and its nuclear capabilities. How much do we know about what is taking place in, Afghan in, in Pakistan, and how much control does President Musharraf have there? Uh, president Zardari has, uh, again, it's a system where you have a president, a prime minister. Uh, and in fact, one of the interesting dynamics, of course, is that Musharraf did concentrate power in the presidency. And some of that has devolved, indeed, back to the, the prime minister, I think in a way that many observers would think is probably healthy. Of course, the security forces, in particular the army, uh, very significant role uh, in society. For what it's worth, we just had, I just hosted the army chief of Pakistan in Tampa this past weekend. He was down there meeting with me, meeting with my special operations command uh, swim buddy there, great Navy SEAL, uh, Admiral Eric Olson. Uh, and we had very good sessions with them down there. In fact, they are now, there's a Pakistani delegation now in Washington uh, carrying out what is termed the strategic dialogue, the foreign minister, the De minister of defense, and General Kiani, the army chief. Um, I go in there probably every two months, uh, or at the very least, we'll meet General Kiani somewhere else in the world, uh, at least every two months. Uh, we have a three-star admiral there on the ground probably less than a couple hundred troops that are doing security assistance, cooperation, coordination, some, some training assistance, uh, and so forth, but not doing the fighting. Um, the Pakistani forces are definitely doing the fighting. Uh, now they are focused on those elements that have threatened their country, uh, which are the Pakistani Taliban. Why don't you give me the Fatah slide, please? And I'll just talk a little bit about what they've done. Um, what you'll recall is about a year and a half ago, there was growing concern about Swat Valley, which is this valley right here in the Malakan Division of the Northwest Frontier Province. Um, and again, this is the, if you can see this, this is this portion of Pakistan. Islamabad is just right over here. Uh, I'm sorry, it's right there. So here is Pakistan, and this is a blow up of this inset box right here. 
This is the federally administered tribal areas. These are the different agencies along here. This is Afghanistan, and you can see how close Kabul is right through the Khyber Pass, almost on a direct line from Peshawar to Kabul. Uh, big concern about Swat Valley where the Pakistani Taliban, again, a different element from the Afghan Taliban, but, but a relationship. Uh, that, uh, organ that element, that extremist element, was taking over uh, from literally challenging the writ of governance of Pakistan and, and basically took over that whole picturesque valley. It, it's a really a tourist, major tourist center in Pakistan. And they did the same in the other districts of the Malakan Division, Bunir, Lower Deer, and so forth. And they started to push out of here and uh, horrific activities that they carried out. You may recall that there's literally on film sawing off an individual's head, whipping women, uh, burning or closing down all the girls' schools, uh, banning music, banning haircuts, a whole bunch of or shaves, a whole bunch of different, very oppressive social practices, indiscriminate violence, and extremist ideology. And the Pakistani people uh, essentially recognized this and realized that these individuals want to turn the clock back several centuries where they want to progress forward. And they recognized that all the political leadership came together, even the opposition figures and the clerics, and they recognized the need to do something about this problem. That gave the army the support it needed, and the army and the Frontier Corps went in there and conducted very impressive. This, some of these are 14, 15,000 foot peaks on the side here. This is really, I was just in there uh, about three or four weeks ago, in fact, in upper SWAT as well as lower SWAT. Upper SWAT's literally cut off right now because of avalanches, a uh, foot and a half of snow on the ground. So they did a very good uh, operation, and it, they have conducted impressive clearance operations. They're now in the hold phase, uh, and then the build, and over time in the transition phase. Uh, there are limited resources. That's a challenge. That's where we need to help more. We have an enormous stake in this, and that's why the Kerry Luger Berman Bill, $1.5 billion dollars per year for each of the next five years in economic assistance. It's why we provide about 1.5 billion uh, in security assistance as well. That was a very good operation. They then went down into eastern south Waziristan after uh, Baitula Masood's, the former Baitula Masood, late Baitula Masood was killed uh, in an explosion that took place out there that we don't talk about. And he um, was the head of the organization also linked into the Pakistani Taliban that killed Benazir Bhutto, uh, that um, blew up thousands of innocent Pakistani civilian security force members, the Marriott Hotel, uh, markets, the visiting cricket teams, and so forth. And they did a very good operation there. They've conducted other operations in and around uh, North Waziristan. Uh, they just did a very good one in Baijur, and the coordination with our forces on the other side was so good that when some of the Taliban came over into Afghanistan, we were waiting for them, and we engaged them as that took place. So, been good operations, but have they gone after every element out there? No. Uh, there's Al-Qaeda in here, there is Commander Nazir, there's the Haqqani Network, there are other organizations, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, et cetera, that have gone after some of them, but there are just limits to their capacity. They've got somewhere around 150,000 troops engaged in this, and they've got a lot of short sticks and a lot of hornet's nests right now, and they've got to consolidate some of those gains with our assistance, uh, not our troops, but with our resource assistance, our monetary assistance and so forth, uh, to ensure that they can then move on and continue to deal with the extremist threats that really they have come to see as the most pressing threat to their very existence, keeping in mind that India is always the traditional mm -hmm. uh, enemy for Pakistan. So that's sort of what has taken place over the course of the last year or so. We've been talking uh, a lot about Pakistan, but let's also talk a, a little bit about Iran because sometimes it gets overshadowed. And we talk about Iran a lot, but a lot of people feel that it is overshadowed. Where does their nuclear program rank in terms of our national security? Well, um, you know, the President, Vice President, and others, Secretary of State uh, have announced uh, that Pakistan can't get nuclear weapons, that that, that would have an enormous uh, impact on the region, uh, but that's a real conundrum. Uh, and uh, they, I think it is accurate to say that the supreme leader of Iran may not have made the final decision, the final go-ahead to actually produce a nuclear weapon. 
but all the components of a nuclear weapons program and of missile technology, of uh, refinement of uranium. Uh, they now have somewhere around 2,200, 2,300 uh, kilograms of low enriched uranium. They'd have to enrich it much more. But, but again, that's presumably doable. Uh, they have flouted the International Atomic Energy Agency. I mean, we spent a year, last year, appropriately, I think, uh, with our partners uh, seeking to resolve these differences diplomatically, to stretch out an open hand, as it was termed, uh, and they have not grabbed that open hand. And they turned down the, uh, an agreement to swap out low enriched uranium for some highly enriched uranium they could use in, in a research reactor in Tehran, for example. Uh, and uh, this worries the countries in the region enormously, needless to say. And not only that, give me the Iran slide, if you would, please, because I want to show you the number one recruiting officer for U.S. Central Command. Uh, here he is right here. If you can't see him carefully, it's President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, er, I'm, uh, uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, President Ahmadinejad. Uh, he is in, in, this is, we think, the Natansk uh, refinery a nuclear refinery uh, in among the cascades there. Uh, he is, with every one of his speeches, uh, you know, he denies the existence of the Holocaust, for example. Of course, they're providing weapons, training, funding, direction to ex extremist militias in Iraq, to Lebanese Hezbollah, missile technology there that's particularly worrisome, Hamas in Gaza, and to a limited degree, uh, the Taliban in uh, Western Afghanistan, and then pursuing a variety of asymmetric threats, as we call it, and missile uh, threats quite aggressively. And needless to say, the concern on this side of the Gulf and, and out here, and of course also among Israel, is very, very substantial. And um, that is why we say that he's our, that President Ahmadinejad is our number one recruiter, because each time he takes another provocative action, gives another threatening speech, uh, they want to uh, share in some partnership uh, ever more than before. I think it's a, it has been announced, it's a fact, for example, that we have uh, a number of Patriot missile batteries out there now that where a couple of years ago we had none or more Aegis missile. Uh, all these are defensive systems because of concerns about uh, what Iran has been doing and, and in a sense threatens to do. And you talk about our partners in the region this week. The president hosted uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu down in Washington, D.C. Fair to say that the, the discussion centered on Iran at one point, and it's safe to assume that they'd like to see us become more aggressive in dealing with the containment of their nuclear program? I mean, I, I hesitate to speculate about that, but I mean, I actually, as that old wonderful BBC series, The House of Cards, as the, you know, the villainous prime minister used to say, you might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Um, I, I, I mean, I didn't, it wasn't there. You know, Israel and uh, Palestinian territory is not in central command areas of responsibility. They're carved out, they're part of the European command and have been for decades. A rumor that was on the blog, by the way, that I asked to have that join to CENTCOM was just flat inaccurate. We did not recommend it. Certainly looked at it as every CENTCOM commander has uh, in recent uh, decades, probably. Um, but, I mean, one would assume that, that that was a topic of discussion. All right, we only have a few minutes left, General. Uh, let's talk about the troops. You must be stunned by the morale and the commitment. I mean, it's an all-volunteer force. We're stretched thin. Uh, so many have been sent on multiple deployments to different areas of the world. Do you ever look back and sit back and just say, wow? Oh, we do. I'll show you at the end. Uh, I'll show you a picture that more than any other time in my uh, career was a moment where I looked at a sea of soldiers and, and sort of asked, you know, where do we find these great young men and women? And the truth is we find them throughout our country. We find them in cities, we find them in the country, we, wherever it may be. Um, one reason, I think, uh, is that they believe that they're doing something that's very important for our country. They're carrying out missions that are of uh, enormous significance. And frankly, their fellow citizens back home appreciate their service, they appreciate their sacrifice, and they appreciate that of their families, too. Again, many of these families have, uh, you know, my wife was <coughs> Mrs. Dad for something like five and a half out of a seven-year period. Uh, and so, but, you know, the support from the local communities, wherever 
she and her other uh, uh, comrades, the other spouses whose uh, husbands or wives were deployed, um, was always extraordinary. And I think that that is a big factor uh, in why these individuals have continued. And I, if you'll give me an, a moment at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Two, two questions I have to get to. One centers on policy, the don't ask, don't tell. The national <coughs> directive has been set on this. Do you think it's time for that to be repealed? Well, what I told the, the Senate Armed Services Committee last week in, in response to a question is that I think it is time to consider uh, the change in the don't ask, don't tell policy. It should be done in a deliberate and thoughtful manner, uh, which includes ensuring that the uh, review that has been ordered by Secretary Gates be, to be led by his general counsel, Jay Johnson, and the U.S. Army Europe commander, uh, General Carter Hamm, is able to conduct its review. That will be done by about the end of the year. Uh, it will look at views in the force uh, on uh, gays and lesbians serving uh, openly. It will look at what policies would be needed if there were to be a change, and then would make recommendations on sensible policies. Uh, it would look at the experiences of other countries, and 25 other countries have done this, including uh, UK, Israel, Canada, and a, and a variety of others. Uh, and it would look at what the likely effect would be on uh, morale, recruiting, readiness, retention, uh, and, and all the rest of that. The truth is that we all have uh, various personal views. We all have, I've really looked at this hard, I've researched it, I've you know, developed personal thoughts. But we really need that kind of review that can objectively and with real rigor uh, determine all of that for the decision makers so that if there's a change, it can be done in a way that is, again, sensible and rational, and uh, if it's done, uh, would be as uneventful as it has been in, say, these other 25 countries or so that have done it. Quickly, I want to talk about your future. Uh, any truth to the rumor that you're going to, straight to Iowa after this? Is that? <laughs> no. You know, there was, a, <laughs> there was a, a blogger for, I think it was the Weekly Standard one time, who started a rumor that I was going to Iowa, and it took us about four days to beat that back. And I uh, have no plans uh, to go to Iowa. I hear it's a wonderful state, uh, very attractive, uh, but no plans to visit there before 2012. If I could say, look, I, uh, I, as I told the press earlier today when we, when we did the press availability, I feel very privileged to have served our country in uniform. Uh, I'm honored to continue to do that as long as that uh, service is desired. Uh, but I have absolutely no plans, no desire, and no willingness at all uh, to uh, seek any kind of political office in the future. I've tried doing Sherman-esque denials. Uh, you know, if you go back, I, <laughs> people went back and researched what he said. It was quite blunt, shall we say. Uh, I've tried quoting uh, the great song that uh, country singer Lori Morgan used to sing, uh, what about, what part of no don't you understand? And, uh, <laughs> So I just end up by saying no. Well, in politics, no has a number of different uh, definitions. Not, not, not here. I, uh, <laughs> I must confess that I did not realize until with horror as I was coming up here that this is where presidential debates are conducted. No, no, wonder, <laughs> no wonder there was great speculation at the gridiron dinner last Saturday night in Washington or whenever it was. If I can end up with one Absolutely. thing here. Please. Uh, can you give me the recruiting slide, please? This is a photo. Uh, taken on the 4th of July 2008, as it says, in Iraq. It was in Baghdad. It was in the headquarters uh, of the multinational force Iraq. I was the commander at the time. And I was privileged to be the reenlistment officer for the largest, we think, the largest reenlistment ceremony in our military's history, 1,215 uh, great soldier, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And they all have the right hand in the air. They are reciting the oath of enlistment. They are reenlisting in, uh, in our respective military services. And the truth is we didn't set out to break a record. We didn't, I mean, think of the logistics of this, actually, to bring in a combat zone 1,215 individuals to one place to billet them, to feed them, and of course they all bring their reenlistment NCOs. Uh, not only that, we rashly, my sergeant major and I said, you know, we'll do a photo with each one. This is back when it was 150 or something. Uh, <laughs> We'll give you a coin, and I, you have to sign, you know, every single, and I don't use an auto pen. So this is about a several week effort. It was worth it, uh, because I've never felt the emotions, again, about our young men and women uh, as we felt in that particular case. And as you look at them again, you ask, you know, what is it? You know, it's not the stock options. Um, 
This was before the economy had turned down, so you can't say it was that they were worried about employment. In fact, the economy was still booming at this time, I think. Uh, and it comes back to what I was mentioning earlier, and that is that they feel part of something larger than self. Uh, they're serving a mission that they know is very important. Uh, they realize that, that it is something of huge consequence to our country and that their fellow citizens appreciate what they do. Uh, and they feel honored to do it with the individuals uh, on their right and left uh, with whom they serve. Uh, you know, it's not all sweetness and light, um, but there they are. And uh, it was just an extraordinary moment. And as I started out by saying, I think a huge reason for this is because of the support they get back home. And so let me just end by saying thanks very much on their behalf and on behalf of the more than 210,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and the Central Command Area of Responsibility. Thank you for your great support of them and of their families. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Don't, don't leave yet. Got one more event. One more thing to bring Lauren back up. Thank you. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, we'd like to give you a token of our appreciation. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Here. There you go. Hold that up. That'll fit. Yep. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Well, that's going to do it with our conversation with General David Petraeus. Thanks very much for joining us here tonight. It was fantastic. And from the campus of St. Anselm College thanks. and the New Hampshire Thank Institute you. of Politics, thanks very thanks. much for joining us. Have Thank a fantastic you. night.